Good evening, everyone. We're just going to wait for a few more folks to join and then we'll get started. We're just letting folks join for about one more minute and then we're just going to get started very shortly. Thanks everyone for joining. Okay, so I think we'll kick things off. Um, so good evening, everyone. My name is Tiff Blair, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer here with VRPN. Um, and today I'm honored to be your facilitator for this Nursing Week session uh, focused on our fireside chat discussion about reclaiming pride in nursing. So to start off, we're going to be acknowledging that VRPN is on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek peoples. With this, we respect the longstanding relationships that Indigenous nations have to this land as they are the original caretakers. We also acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples endure in Canada and accept responsibility as a professional organization to contribute towards revealing and correcting misinformation, as well as renewing respectful relationships with Indigenous communities through our teaching, research, care provision and community service. Um, so I'd also like to acknowledge all of the amazing RPNs across the care continuum and extend my heartfelt thank you to each and every one of you um, this special nursing week. Thank you so much for the work that you do every day on behalf of Ontario patients, residents and clients um, and the commitment that you have to your communities across the province. So we're really here to celebrate you and so thankful um, that you're taking part in our discussion this evening. So um, just in terms of logistics, we're gonna have a conversation uh, with our guests this evening. Um, we have the chat function enabled and the Q&A. So um, we'll start off with some introductions and a bit of a conversation. If at any point there are questions from the audience, we invite you to ask your questions through the chat or Q&A, um, and we'll, we'll bring those to our guests. Um, and if you have any technical challenges, uh, you know, in this Zoom world, feel free to email our colleagues at ppractice at wrpn, um, or give us a call at 416-302-9940, and one of our team will help you. And then also at the end of our session, we'll be announcing um, the winner of one of our Nursing Week uh, prizes. So we're giving away um, a prize to participants at each of our virtual events this week. So it's a lovely little gift basket that we've pulled together. Um, so stay tuned to the end and we'll have, uh, we'll announce who will be winning that great prize. Um, so now I have the honor of presenting our guest for this session. Um, so we're joined by um, Dr. Karima Velji. So just a little bit about Dr. Velji. Dr. Velji is a healthcare leader with a proven track record in fostering engagement of patient care and the system partners to drive innovative models of care, integrating research and care to drive next practice and creating cultures to unleash the potential of high performing teams to achieve stellar results. She's in, implemented innovative health human resources uh, resource solutions within these models of care to ensure optimal scope of practice for all clinicians. She's currently the Chief of Nursing and Professional Practice and Assistant Deputy Minister for the Province of Ontario. She's also held senior leadership positions in several academic health sciences center, has operated a successful com consulting company as well. 
Uh, Dr. Velji's responsibilities extend to provincial and national leadership, where she's held roles as a vice chair of the board of directors of Accreditation Canada and a member of the board of directors of health standard organizations, the United Way chair for London Middlesex and mm -hmm. president and chair of the board of directors of the Canadian Nursing Association. So thank you very much, Dr. Velji, for joining us and looking forward to the conversation. Um, and then we also have our CEO, Diane Martin. So Diane Martin has been a nurse since 1979. She graduated first as an RPN, and then uh, in 1998, graduated with an RN diploma in nursing and is duly registered as both an RN and RPN. She works in the R as in her role as RPN as Chief, Chief Executive Officer for WeRPN, where she's been recognized for her work to build bridges, uh, foster greater understanding, and more respect among the categories of nurses in Ontario. Diane has experienced working in several Ontario hospitals, predominantly in the, in the field of perinatal care. She has, several, has held several leadership positions, including professional practice coordinator in an Ontario hospital, senior policy analyst in the nursing policy and innovation branch of the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care that was formerly the nursing secretariat. In 2016, Diane received the Premier's Award, which recognizes college graduates whose achievements have made a difference in the province of Ontario. She's also the daughter of the nurse, of a nurse, the mother to a nurse, and holds those um, who care for others in the highest regard. So thank you as well, Diane, for joining us this evening. Thank you. Um, so I guess we'll start with a bit of a question for both of you. Um, what inspired you both to pursue careers in nursing and healthcare leadership? Why don't we start with you, Dr. Belgi? Oh, I was going to say, Diane, you go first. <laughs> I just want to say I so um, admire Diane and what a pleasure it is to work with Diane, even in her role as a policy advocate, basically, the constructive way in which she builds bridges with other nursing organizations, roles, and the constructive manner in which she positions her ideas. That's the kind of leader I want to be like. So, Diane, it's just a pleasure to do this panel Thank with you. you. I mean that. I also want to acknowledge the presence in, amongst the participants today <clears throat> is Natalie, Dr. Natalie Woodrow who is a director of our nursing and health professions branch in the division that I lead. And she's participating and celebrating with us today. And I know she's a big fan of Diane, we RPN, RPNs. And uh, I, I'll tell you, she um, advocates very effectively for you and the programs that you lead. So really wanted to acknowledge her presence. What led me to nursing was a personal experience that I had. I grew up in Tanzania, and I was sharing this experience actually this morning when I was speaking at UHN, but, and the same question was asked, what brought you into nursing? My dad died when I was, he was 34 years old. I was 10 at the time, and I was a child. I was the eldest child of a mom who was widowed at age 33. She was 33, my dad died at 34, and we were 10, 6, and 3, the three daughters. But um, the experience, so with my very young eyes, the experience we had with interacting with healthcare as we helped my dad um, deal with his illness and his journey was very profound, very impactful for me because every interaction we had with the healthcare system the hospital back in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania was it started with a visit to the um, business office of the hospital, and you had to enter. You had to put, uh, transact a sum of money with the business office before anyone would even put their eyes on you. People would die in the hallways, waiting for someone to put their eyes on them because either they didn't have money or. Time, it took time to transact that money. So I just thought with my very, very young self, this is not right. Healthcare has to be a human right. It should be accessible to us very equitably, very equally. Uh, and it is a human rights issue. And I'm going to 
that's where I'm going to spend, um, that's where I'm going to build my career, basically, and try and make a difference. And I became a big proponent and will never stop being a proponent for publicly funded health system. This idea that healthcare has to be accessible to everyone. I thought I was entering nursing to be a stepping stool to medical school. That's how I thought. I thought it's a pre-med program I'm entering and then I'll go off and be a physician. But by the third year of my nursing program at McMaster, I was completely convinced and that I love this profession inside out. The values spoke to me of nursing, the holistic care, the responsiveness to illness, like the way nurses have to deal with healthcare matters for the population and we are with patients. We understand where they are and we journey with them on their uh, health and illness journeys. All of that uh, really spoke to me. And I thought I never looked back since. All my subsequent education um, was nursing, nursing, and nursing. And it changed my life completely and the life of my family and every society I've touched using my nursing knowledge and globally. I felt, I feel it has opened doors and doors of not only opportunity for me, but doors to make a difference. But it was very personal, a personal experience that brought me to that place. Thank you so much. How about you, Diane? Well, I think pretty much everyone knows that my mom was a nurse because I talk about her a lot. If you look at my Facebook right now, you'll see a big picture of my mom uh, for Nursing Week that one of my daughters put up, by the way. But um, I, I was fascinated by her because we grew up, I grew up in a very small town. And mm -hmm. when people didn't want to bother the doctor, they would call my mom at home which I guess people just couldn't see the irony in that, but um, she was beloved. And when she died, she also died uh, relatively young. Um, I didn't know the difference that she made in that town until the, the funeral. And people told me, they would say, you know, I want to tell you something your mom did. And, um, you know, I just would always be asking her questions and and um, that sort that sort of thing. But the other reason, and I don't ever talk about this, but I do want to mention it today. The other reason I went into nursing is because um, for a lot of extenuating circumstances, my family was very um, poor, very financially challenged. We didn't have, we didn't always know when the, when the phone would be shut off, the power shut off, um, not be able to have groceries. I don't tell that story very often, but at the time, my high school had an RNA program, and you could go there and study and graduate grade 12 as an RPN. And I knew because of my family situation that I needed to earn money immediately after high school. I, I worked from the time I was 14, but, but I knew that post-secondary wasn't in the cards for me, and I knew I was going to have to continue to help support my family. And so I went to that high school program that allowed me to become a practical nurse, which I was thrilled with. And I loved the job from day one. But that is the reason why you'll hear me um, quite often advocating for programs that support people with support for uh, tuition, whether you're a PSW becoming an RPN or an RPN becoming an RN, um, whether you're an RPN who wants to study through the Nursing Education Initiative to, to become specialized within the RPN role. The roots of all of that are in those early days when I don't know where I would be right now if that program hadn't been offered. And um, I just, uh, that was a real driver. And I don't think I've ever really publicly told that story before, but I wanted to share that with you. Thanks so much, Diane. So it sounds like there's, you know, common themes around personal lived experience really driving yeah. you to the profession for different different yeah. reasons, but ending up in the same place. And I think the other, the other theme that I heard from Karima's comments is also, you know, you may have had uh, one thought in mind about where you thought you would go. Maybe you thought of nursing as a, a one part on the longer journey towards a different different career potentially, but that the the profession itself was so meaningful um, that it it caused you to stay. And I think that sort of ties into our broader discussion around pride in nursing. I'm wondering if you can um, 
talk about how you see pride in nursing and why you think it's important. Maybe Diane, we'll start with you. Okay, well, um, you know, really pride in nursing, I think almost 100% comes from our interactions with our patients and making a difference in people's lives. You know, I think it's one of the most important professions in terms of, uh, of just a group of people who are motivated by making a difference. I, I remember one night saying to a, um, to my the two o'clock in the morning, saying to the rest of the nurses, listen, I don't like, I was a labor nurse at the time. I don't like what's going on. I don't, I can't put my finger on why I feel yucky about that patient, but I think I'm just going to sit with her. And then I came out and I called the doctor and I said, you know what? It might be nothing, but I think she might be dying. And I can't even tell you why I think that. And then the trust between a nurse and a, a physician who comes out and says, then I'm going to come over. And within 10 minutes, we had that woman in an operating room, um, it, saving her life. And um, I, to this day, don't know how I knew um, her urine was dark, her kidneys weren't perfused. I didn't, I didn't know. It turned out she was having a massive he hemorrhage from a fallopian tube, but, but that going home that day, that's where you get the pride from. I saved that woman or the days where, you know, you make eye contact with a patient and, and, um, you know, that they trust you and they're just going to let go of all of their worries because they trust you. And you, it's those things that give us pride. It's not necessarily what a non-nurse might think. Great. Um, I'd also just say before I pass it over to Karima, um, if folks um, who are participating have thoughts about pride in nursing, I invite you to share those ideas um, in the chat as well so that you can engage in the discussion. So over to you, Karima. I see that in my mom right now, Diane, exactly the phenomenon you've just described, which is when she is in the hands of great nurses, she actually lets go. It's like a trust, a freedom of just being comfortable that um, um, it's really actually, it's exactly the way you describe it, it's letting go. And now someone else is here who will hold me and care for me properly um de definitely that's the driver that's the pride that's the place where pride comes from but also for me having now um experienced several policy kind of roles and being in the role that i'm in now i would also say pride comes from the fact that we are the biggest number of healthcare professions that touch patient care. There are six nurses for every physician, for example, in Ontario. We are the largest num in numbers of people who touch healthcare. We touch it 24 seven. So mostly we are not episodic in our approach. We are the continuous care provider. We are in all settings. We are often the first point of contact and we are highly trusted profession. When you ask the public, who do they trust the most? We come up at the top of the list again and again in the polling that's done. So we should really also, other than, of course, uh, feeling very proud about the difference we make to people's lives, the pride we should have about becoming architects of the healthcare system and how it should be, how it should be run for patients if we leveraged all of those advantages that we have, our numbers, the trust the public has in us, the intimate understanding of the healthcare system that we know. And we are the, you know, go to people when you want to get things done, you go to a nurse. That's who you go to, to manage a pandemic or manage an emergency in a hospital. We know how to do it. If we leveraged all of that and became a bit united and focused, focused in the work we should do and a bit of a future orientation, there would be nothing stopping us from completely transforming the system which badly needs system transformation. It should bug us that so many people are not attached to primary care, that the home care wait lists are the way they are. People wait years to get into a long-term care facility and only people in hospitals are prioritized to go there. Like 
all of these things get under my skin. They have driven me to this role, I have to tell you. That's why I went here to do this work on our 18-7 workload type of work at this stage of my life. But I, that's what I care about. We should not be in agreement with the way things are now, but we have work to do within the profession to become united in our voice, to become focused in our advocacy, to find our signals basically in the noise of policy and advocacy work and to kind of take it on and be hopeful about the future, move forward to the future with hope and some positive energy. Because the energy right now or the ret around the rhetoric of nothing, very negative, very negative. Humanly, people stop listening to that. Just humanly. People want to be inspired by what the possibilities of the future. I, I wish we could find our collectiveness on that front. Truly. Thanks, Karima. Um, we have a, a comment from Nancy who says that I can't tell you the relief I felt when the RPN entered my, dad, my dad's room in long-term care when he was in the end of his life. Such assurance and the ability to co console him and us. That's so lovely, mm. Nancy. Thank you for sharing that. Um, just to pick up on one of the comments that you made, Karima, I think... Um, it's interesting because we're talking about the, you know, the current healthcare landscape. And I think uh, nurses recognize there have been a lot of challenges over the last couple of years, well, four years in particular. And now for many, we're entering kind of a turning point where some have talked about maybe there have been minor improvements here or there, but there's still more work to, to do. I'm curious how you, uh, how you would advocate to nurses to have a forward vision while still acknowledging the very difficult realities that nurses face on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, for me, the, it's a Maslow hierarchy. You have to pay attention to the basic survival needs um, that we face while you are uh, striving for self-actualization. So it's doing both. It's the attention to both issues. And you will see this in the HHR work that Natalie, myself, other members of our team are leading. There is attention to putting qualified individuals in the organizations now, whether it's externs, supervised practice practitioners, begin practitioners, it doesn't matter. What can we do very fast to add the right people in the system, but now there's no, we are already late in the game, as you know. We are 15 years late in the game of recruitment and retention. Mm -hmm. For 15 years, right. we ignored, we all ignored the telltale signs that were right in front of us. We predicted the shortages that came upon us before the pandemic 15 years ago to that very number. And we hit those mm -hmm. numbers. And then, of course, the pandemic blew it all open. So it was entirely predictable how we, where we came to, but the pandemic, of course, exacerbated it. So our program, our attention is like that. While we build the workforce for tomorrow, what do we have to do today to put the level of support we need to do in the clinical areas? So you will see that a lot in the programs that we have. It's adding resources to them. We must do both. You can't talk about self-actualization of anything or a future orientation if your basic issues of workload, um, work-life, work-life balance, compensation, those very, very basic issues that we need to schedule, for all of that staffing have to be dealt with as we are building for the future. So. Our strategy does take that into account, but as I said, we are catch up is the name, the game we are playing right now. So it feels mm -hmm. like, oh my God, yeah, we are making a difference, but the impact you should feel on the ground is only starting to be felt. And I wanted to convey that, by the way. I wanted to say every data we are looking at now, and I'm a big believer of data. If you don't measure, you don't manage. 
So we mm. follow very objective data, not our own data. We follow the College of Nurses data, OHA's data on vacancy, uh, turnover, etc. The uh, data from schools, uh, colleges, and universities. All of the data tell us we are turning the corner in a positive way towards staffing solutions. So for the first time, we are seeing our vacancies actually not only stabilizing, but reducing in the hospital sector. I'm going, to, I'm going to be clear about that. In the hospital sector, we are starting to see stabilization of turnover, vacancies, agency use. Of course, more work to be done in long-term care and home care, where I know majority of the RPMs practice. And we are also seeing historical, actually, expansion of the nursing workforce in the province. Uh, I would just urge you to look at the College of Nurses website for their monthly reports on nursing growth. We are growing our workforce net by 5,000 nurses every year, and our attrition is stable at 8%. So there's so many good news. That's part of it as well. The way you build hope is you have to stop talking about the skies falling only because that becomes a very big self-fulfilling prophecy. It's not a hopeful approach. You have to keep on showing you're making strides and you have to show the metrics that support that. Then people get hopeful and they, they might stay a year or two more while we are producing a new work, workforce. But mm -hmm. it's that very fine balance you have to walk and it's all action. It's action that builds hope, not words. I'm a big believer of that as well. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Diana, do you have thoughts on that? I know um, our work is really focused on, of course, the RPN experience, which I think sometimes is a little bit different than um, RNs as well. So just curious what your thoughts are there. Yeah. First of all, I want to say that um, Karima and Natalie, who's online, um, who works closely with Karima, they, I, I think our parents need to know that they rarely say no. When we go to them with, okay, here's what we need and here's what we think you could do and here's, you know, they rarely say no. Quite often they'll say, leave it with us. Let us see if we can find a way. I think nurses need to know that. Um, but probably the hardest part of my job is that our role is to be the voice of practical nurses. And practical nurses are really, really struggling right now. The growth in nurses, um, it tends to be more on the RN side, that, and that leaves RPNs um, short-staffed more often, um, and all that goes along with that. So yearly, we do our state of nursing survey. We've done it most recently, and practical nurses are still struggling, and they want us to tell that story. And yet, as Tiff would tell you, we have this conversation every day, today included, I always want to remind them that it was, is, and I'm sure will be the best profession into the future, but there are things that have to be fixed. And when RPNs t tell us, we, you need to tell our story, we're gonna tell their story. And it's not great in the workplace right now, but that's why I think it's important to mention that, um, Many of the things that we see being put in place to support nurses um, are starting to work. Um, are nurses feeling it yet? Um, I think they aren't articulating that they're feeling it yet. Um, I've said to Karima just today that I think that we're really going to start to see things look different. But right now, practical nurses are really, really struggling. And that balance that Karim is talking about is very, very hard to strike that balance when, when I know who I work for. And I know that they don't have an opportunity to say, you know, to have the stage to say, here's what I live. And so I need to do that. And, and I take any and everyone's help on how I do that and yet remain positive about this profession. It's a real balancing act that I have to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thanks, Diane. I, under I understand it, Diane. I do. 
It's very understandable. Uh, and Thank you, you have to be responsive. And these are members. Yes. These are the yes. members you represent. So, of course, yeah. you're fulfilling your duty to represent their perspectives well to us. And we'll continue to not only listen, but to act on those perspectives. I have to say, some of the interventions towards that issue lies with government, but much of the work lies with organizations. And we were talking about an organization you and Natalie visited recently in Ottawa. There are cultures and then there are cultures. And I'm mm -hmm. out and about a lot. So is Natalie. We want our ear to the ground, basically. And I have to tell you, every culture, every organization is different. There are organizations in Ontario hospitals that have zero agency. Zero agency, and they have had mm -hmm. zero agency. They have 50, almost 50% of them. Think about it. What, what are they doing differently in their cultures that others yeah. who are using 70%, 80% agency for the work that hours? What is the difference? Sometimes these organizations are side by side, so you can't even say it's geography. Yes. <laughs> They're sometimes side by side organizations whose turnover, retention, recruitment, vacancies look completely different from each other. So that microculture work yeah. at the organization level, I would say, is an opportunity to be realized because therein lies a lot of the answer for retention. A lot of the answers for retention lies in workplaces. And, and you know, Karima, that is why this year, for the first time, you don't know this yet, but for the first time, we've added in, in our list of recommendations of things that we'd like to see happen, we've added in um, the just a greater support from the um from the leadership in organizations a lot of it, a lot of it uh the culture depends on that and i'm just going to say where we were we were at chio in ottawa and i was halfway through my tour there and i i see and hear a lot of struggle but I was halfway through my tour of Chio and I thought to myself, I could work here. And then I reminded myself that I'm 63 and I'm not ever going to work at Chio. But but I um, just felt like when I did my leadership, my master's in leadership, they they talked about the smell of the place. And they don't mean literal smell. They just mean when you walk in and you get this feeling. And yeah. Chia, and they, they let me speak to RPNs on every unit. And um, it was quite... Uh, quite a refreshing view of what could be. And I had the same experience two months ago at St. Thomas Elgin Hospital by London. And the same thing, they took me to Emerge. There's a section of Emerge that is run entirely by RPNs. Those RPNs love what they do. They showed me their whiteboard with the evidence of their work. There was so much pride. And so um, it is, there is pockets of greatness. And Karima, you are not wrong that the government can't fix all of that, that organizations themselves need to um, support their leaders as well. Uh, senior leaders need to support the more junior leaders, but in order to create that culture that is so great. I agree. Yeah, I think that's a great segue, Diane, because my next question was really about leadership and, you know, um, picking up on one of Karima's earlier comments about the importance of, you know, strengthening nursing voices and the selective impact that nurses can have in terms of, you know, broader change across the system, but also within their organizations. What do you think are some um, effective strategies for really fostering leadership among nurses um, at all levels of organizations and across all sectors? So uh, maybe Karima, I'll start with you. Um, hold on to our values and hold on to patient care. I even do this in my current role. It doesn't matter which place we find ourselves or role in nursing. It's what grounds you has to be clear. It's what actually uh, grounds you to the ground so that you don't waver with the wind and don't go according to where the wind blows. Your North Star, that has to be crystal clear, the lines you will cross and the lines you will not cross. Even in my current role, I've articulated those lines to my deputy minister. 
I'm saying, you know, if we, I'm okay with compromises. I'm okay to wait for things to happen, the stars to line up. But if we cross one, one of these lines, that's not for me. I think each of our, each one of us, if we could find that grounding very clearly, and I'm not saying make every hill to die on because I never do that. You have to pick and choose. But for certain things, we should be steadfast. I want to see our role, our voice amplified about patient care. Definitely bring attention to the issues that impact our own lives, our work lives, how we feel at work, our roles. Definitely, I'm not saying don't, but I think balance that with the advocacy voice for patient care, because guess what? We have a growing population in Ontario, and a lot of that population is aging, and the work that has to be done with that population is nurse sensitive work. And you can imagine the role of the RPM with the aging population. I, you know it better than me. It's a profound role. We should be showing the world the solutions that are needed for the aging population. We should be plugging those solutions into our nursing curricula, preparing the world for that population so we can care for our elders properly. But we have to have that wherewithal, the ability to look beyond ourselves and to really equally focus on those that we are serving because they need us more than ever, more than ever our nursing is needed. It's nurse sensitive work that's needed with complex populations, complex illnesses, chronic illnesses, the issues of healthcare of today. It's not the healthcare system of previous. It's not episodic care. It's chronic continuous care. It's nursing. If that's not nursing, what, what is it? We have the best knowledge to put forward. But I would, I can, I cannot remember the last time I've heard a nursing voice in the media that's positioning a solution around the patient care issue. It bothers the heck out of me. I'm not allowed to speak to media because I'm not an elected official. I'm a bureaucrat in government. So I don't speak to media. I'd love to. <laughs> but nurses can, you can, all of you, all of you can. And for God's sake, for once, speak about patients and the people we serve yeah. and put some solutions forward for them. Really. Mm -hmm. Um, so before I pass it over to you, Diane, I'll just uh, highlight a couple of comments that we're getting. So, so great to see everyone um, adding their comments in the chat. So Lorianne just says that St. Thomas uh, is her is her home. So she's celebrating that. Great to see okay. that. Uh, took me a second to be like, what's that acronym? But I figured it out. Um, <laughs> And then uh, kind of in on the vein that we're talking about, Julie says, as a junior leader, if your senior leader is not helping with leading and making the organization better, how do you advocate for change? So maybe if I pass it over to you, Diane, you can kind of yeah. take that question. Yeah. Um, so I can't imagine a harder job in an organization than the junior leader who has incredible pressure from the senior team because it's tough times and heartbreaking pressure from the nursing staff. And, you know, my, my advice to those junior leaders is very concrete. Um, you know, the more difficult it is to go out and be among your people, the more important it is for you to get out there among your people. And so if you have a day where it's very short staffed, be very visible on that unit. Be very visible. Acknowledge every day, even though your own job is incredibly hard. Here I am trying to plug my phone in. Um, even though your job is incredibly hard, acknowledge every day how hard the job is of the people who are working through that in frontline care. Uh, the more visible you are, the more you will understand the nursing experience, the more you will humanize yourself to your staff so that they understand 
who you are and your value system rather than having to guess about it. And they will, um, you'll be able to solve problems together. So when I see that message from um, a junior leader, you know, and be be courageous when you advocate for your nurses. Um, we all have seen in action that the nurses who advocate, who show great courage, standing up to someone for something they need for a patient. And um, our, we need our leadership to do that for our, for our nurses. But really, visibility and connection is, is the way to do that. Oh, thank you, Diane. And lend, and lend a hand. Why not? Move mm -hmm. a patient, have bathe a patient, feed a patient. Like in a time of difficulty, we are have to be in it basically together. How many times did I do that in the pandemic on short staff units? Yeah, like don't. Yes. I would be dangerous now doing nursing, very complex <laughs> nursing skills. But yes, I can be with a patient. And keep yes. them calm and help with all the ADL work. Yeah, yeah. lend a hand. The other thing yeah. I would say is maybe it's because I'm now at that age and stage in my life where I'm impatient. You know, I often say to people, we have to have joy at work. If your work is not giving you joy anymore and, and you're not getting the support you need for yourself so that you can be good to others, leave. The world yeah. is your oyster. The world is your oyster. There are many, many doors open for you. We have to be in places where our health and well-being are foremost for ourselves so we can be good fathers. And if your workplace is not allowing you that, there are many workplaces who will. And sometimes, mm -hmm. unfortunately, Sorry, bad workplace cultures have to go through that trepidation in order to rediscover their souls mm -hmm. and themselves. You have to come to a place of, oh my God, I reached the bottom now. And then I'm hoping from there, they will understand the profound work, different work they have to do. I get very impatient now with when we know simple solutions and they are not being put into place. I don't want to be there anymore. Yeah. How, much, very good how, point. Much can, how much can you sweat asking for the same thing over and over when nurses ask for supplies? Like, you know what? Enough. This is the 21st century. You're asking for supplies? <laughs> yeah, so enough, it, please. We have some um, comments from our participants. So Andrea is talking about the great experience with her within her organization. So she says, I'm so proud as an RPN to have held many leadership positions in my organization, staff educator, associate director of care, IPAC manager, and now an IPAC specialist for our support office. I'm proud that my organization uh, believes in us RPNs as well. So that's great, Andrea. And then we have a comment um, that a bit from Jamie, who's highlighting some of the challenges that she faces working in home care in the Northeast. So she says that we've been left to struggle with getting our clients what they need and the support the nurses need just to manage the care. We have been forgotten for palliative care with no doctor, no NP or no hospice. I've been a nurse for 19 years and work in several sectors, and this is a very real struggle every day, um, not just the compensation, but actually having to tell people, I'm so sorry, we don't have that available in your area. Um, and then she also talks about, you know, the difficulty recruiting nurses when you factor in, you know, the the pay and what they could make um, at McDonald's when there's, when you also factor in, you know, the the uh pay for travel and, and details like that um so i think that sort of <clears throat> highlights the points of very a lot of variability across the province in terms of how nurses are supported um i'm wondering if you could talk about uh the importance of mentorship so we've talked a little bit about you know support for more uh, junior nurses in their careers, but personally for yourselves, has mentorship played a role in your leadership journey? And what advice would you have 
um, for nurses entering their careers or even midway through their careers of how they could leverage nurse uh, mentorship on their career path. Diane, do you want to start? Sure. Um, two kinds of mentorship that I think are really important. I was really lucky, first the big overarching umbrella one, I was really lucky that one day at a nursing council meeting, our chief nursing executive said, I see something in you that I think I'd like to mentor. And I literally turned around to see who's Sue talking to. Um, <laughs> and there's no one behind me. And I thought, I said, what? And um, we, we, we developed a formal agreement. I would once a month meet with her. She would tell me, uh, she said to me, do you want just to hear the good stuff that you've done or do you want to hear the whole thing? And I said, oh, no, I definitely want the whole thing. And she was instrumental in my whole career. Every time I've finally gotten into a position and felt comfortable, she'll notice that I'm comfortable and she'll say, um, yeah, we're you're done there. You need to move on. Fortunately, she moved to Australia, so I was able to take a little bit of a breather. Uh, now we're just girlfriends. But um, having someone who really is willing to very uh, professionally help you in that manner is invaluable. But even more important, the thing that we don't do that we could do a lot more of, um, you know, Kuzis and Posner in their leadership talk about encouraging the heart. And all the time in nursing, we see our fellow nurses doing things that we think, oh, I just want to be that person when I grow up someday. You know, like you, we see phenomenal things going on, but we don't tell them. We just look at them in admiration and go on with our day. And we have to, as nurses, um, start the mentorship process by saying to people, whether they're more experienced or less experienced, just our fellow nurses, I need to tell you, I think you are amazing the way you do X, Y, and Z, or when you said that to the patient and I saw the change in the patient, um, that's the start of mentoring. And then hopefully through your career, you'll be able to find someone to formally mentor you into really thinking deeply about leadership. But the nurse to nurse piece, you can start tomorrow. I think it's that's a duty right. women have to each other, particularly. And we must. We must lift each other up. We must be there for each other because who else will do it? If we are not going to do that for each other, but yeah. sometimes you see the opposite behaviors uh, in nursing. Yes. And it, pains, it pains me. Uh, even nursing organizations doing it to each other, if you know what I mean. Like, you know, I'm a big believer of you have to be the wind beneath the sails. And you have to you have to do that for each other. It's a really kind of a we are bound by that duty. It should be a moral responsibility. I uh, agree completely with Diane. It's easy. <laughs> it's actually easy. It's simply yeah. start to recognize, see the good in people, and put some words to it. Acknowledge it. It takes two minutes. That was a great interaction you had with the patient there, or I don't know. That was a great skill you taught me. The mentors I remember were all bedside mentors. Those are the ones I remember the most. The people who held my hand and taught me how to do it the first time. My nurse educator on my unit, Kathy Kitely, the nurse unit administrator, Jillian Miller. I think you are talking of Sue Matthews. Yes, I am, Sue right? Matthews. That's a mentoring kind of leader. And honestly, every person even who I've accidentally, honestly mentored, I didn't even know I was mentoring. It's I still have connections with them um, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. 30 years ago. They never forget you. And I never forget my mentors. And by the way, we also have mentors who teach us how not to do it. So sure. there are mentors who left you, and then there are those um, accidental mentors that you will learn from. And I've had those in my life as well. Uh, difficult leaders where I've said, that's exactly the person I don't want to be. <laughs> when yes. I grow up, they also teach you equally. Equally and just take that learning opportunity from that. Yeah. 
Very good point. They validate your leadership approach. Yeah. That's great. We have a great comment from Lorian who says it was a mentor that pushed her to start school. Now she's an RPN student at 52 years old. Can't wait to say that I'm an RPN with pride. So lovely. Oh, wonderful. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, and then Luann says, if you find yourself thinking a positive thought about someone, you should say it. Even if you feel a little uncomfortable, it could change their day, week, year, or life. That's great. Thanks, Luann. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, so invite other questions from the audience. I realized I missed one question um, from Nancy. So she asked, how can rehabilitation nurses' knowledge, skill, and judgment impact the patients in acute care, rehabilitation care, continuing care, et cetera? Rehab RPNs and foster capacity and rehabilitation to keep patients focused on abilities and, uh, or how can they focus on abilities and not illness? May I answer that first? Sure. Yes. Only because I spent a last amount of my leadership journey in rehab, at Toronto Rehab. So I was an acute care nurse, a nurse leader in acute care. That's who I was. And then Toronto Rehab knocked on my door and said, you know, there's a chief nurse position here and we would uh, like for you to consider it for these reasons. And I said, no, no, I'm an oncology nurse. I want to stick to Princess Margaret. And anyway, I was convinced of the leader there, Mark Rochon, was so inspiring, an accountant, but you would think he was a nurse. He was so phenomenal, such a great male mentor for me. Anyways, off I went to Toronto Rehab and stepping in, I thought, oh my God, this is what emancipated nursing and teamwork looks like. If you want patient-centered care, this is how you do it. If you want emancipated team-based practice, this is how it's done. And we did some amazing work there with CNA rehab competencies. And anyways, the nurses taught me their knowledge and how they cared for the per persons, um, how to meet the goals of the patient, basically, it was just a phenomenal thing to watch. The one thing that we worked a lot on at Toronto Rehab was um, sometimes, when the team would meet, the nurse would not be present. The nurse was preparing the patient for therapy. And I thought, this is rehabilitation. This is all therapy. So we discovered this work in the UK called nursing as therapy. Nursing is therapy. And we oh. played off on that work and developed competencies around that and created the competencies for each type of the rehab population we were serving there spinal cord rehab, acute brain injury rehab, and did knowledge and competency building on that work called nursing as therapy. It is therapy. You are not preparing people for physiotherapy. You are therapy. And how to enact that 24-7 therapy approach in rehab, I, if you haven't read the work, it will serve you very well in the rehabilitation setting. If that's it, you are the 24-7 person who's enabling the person to regain their independence, their function. A one hour of physio doesn't do it. It's you. It's the nursing. My mom just experienced this at Lendhurst. Lendhurst nurses. I don't think I've seen better nurses than the ones I saw at Lendhurst. Oh my God. They knew her goals inside out and how they worked her towards those goals. Phenomenal. Beautiful. I really congratulate you for picking that specialty to work in. I I um I think that's exactly you have an experience that I don't have, Karima. Um, but it sounds to me like it's really respecting the patient. Um the the presence or absence of disease shouldn't define our, our worth. And I, that's what I see in rehab nurses is that each person is as valuable to, 
you know, the society, regardless of what their, their current um, healthcare situation is, that is a uniqueness that I love about all of the rehab nurses, including Nancy, who posed that question that I've met, although Nancy's not a nurse. But anyway, uh, that's another, uh, uh, she's, she's, she's a, an allied healthcare professional with a tremendous respect for nurses. And the, as you know, that is a really cool thing. That's amazing. Um, so again, just invite any last questions or comments from the audience before we close things out, if anyone has any um, final questions. Um, I guess uh, one final question that I'll ask is, what is your hope for the future of nursing? Um, Kareem, I'll go first, if you like, because I'd really like you to tie this up uh, it, it, at the end, because you have such a, a, you know, a huge view of nursing. But for me, it's pretty simple. I have a daughter who's a nurse, and I want her to live the joy that my mom and I both got to experience in this profession. I want her to laugh with her teammates. I want her to um, come home and, and want to talk to me about her job. Um, I, I really want that for her. And when I say that, I mean, I want that for all nurses. And in, in, as a result of that, patients just get that huge circle of care that I spoke about in the beginning. Um, Karima, I'll pass it over to you. Who can say it better than that? That joy, the joy of work, the work that we do, I think should be the foremost kind of vision or view we should have. Because why, if we don't, why are we in this? Where, if, you know, if, this is hard work. Nursing is not yeah. an easy, easy thing to do. And we must, that joyfulness that we should have should uh, carry us basically. But I also want nurses to be um, architects, architects of their patient care delivery of their unit. They should be in charge of that. <laughs> they should be in charge of how our system looks for patients. They should be the people bringing solutions to politicians, to their own leaders about this is how it should be done. We should be a profession that's hardly, like very hard followed and very hard uh, listened to. People should not be making decisions about the healthcare system without nursing info. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being our voice at the at the provincial table, uh, Karima. Thank you so much. Thank you for all your support, folks, and everything that you all do. Big, big thank you from all of us to you. Well, thank you both. I thought this was a really great discussion and thank you so much to our audience for your engagement as well. Um, you know, I think there are some great takeaways from the discussion that kind of recognize, you know, there's challenges out there, but it's really important to be forward looking and look at what opportunities we have both, you know, at a, a macro scale across the health system, but also within our own interactions with our colleagues and within our organization. So, you know, something that really stood out to me is the, the mentoring piece and what you can do to support your colleagues just with a comment, with a question, with a recognition of something that they've done um, for a patient and kind of acknowledging that. Um, and I think really the other the other theme is really around the power of, of the collective voice and really leveraging nurses' voices together to, to bring about change. So um, that's a takeaway for me and hopefully others have great takeaways um, as well. So I'd just like to thank our guests this evening um, for joining us and um, everyone for, for tuning in. Um, just a couple of little announcements on our end. Um, so we still have some other Nursing Week events if you'd like to join um, in the next couple of days. Uh, all of our events are also recorded, so we'll be sharing around um, the recordings if there were any events that uh, you weren't able to take part in. Um, also wanted to everyone to know that our Awards of Excellence nominations are now open, so that's a really um, building on that theme of recognition, it's a really great way uh, to recognize fellow RPNs or RPN employers for excellent work that they're doing. So those will be um, announced at our AGM. And 
we are pn is also doing a lot of uh in-person engagement so this summer and fall we'll be doing more workshops on collaborative leadership for nurses so uh, be sure to stay tuned to our website and social media for those things as well um and now without further ado the prize giveaway <laughs> um so i'm just going to have my colleague bring up the screen to show um a little thing of how we can uh who's going to win the great prize pack oh this is interesting Let's see. Yeah. Oh, i'm waiting with bated breath oh. Oh, so we have a winner, Jacqueline. Um, so congratulations to Jacqueline. And uh, we will be in touch. Someone from the WeRPN team uh, will be in touch to uh, coordinate getting the prize over to you. So again, thank you so much um, to our guests and to everyone who joined and um, wishing you all a wonderful nursing week. Happy Nursing Week and such great thanks to Karima. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a great evening.